chiaramente hai giocato tantissimi Open d'Italia, questo però ha un sapore speciale perché è il tuo primo Open da vice capitano del Team Europe della Ryder Cup. Sì, sicuramente un sapore particolare, e non vedo l'ora di, di iniziare a giocare sul serio giovedì, e credo che sicuramente sono stati, saranno giorni ancora molto intensi, abbiamo fatto... Ieri abbiamo fatto un giro del campo insieme a Luke, Donald, eh, stamattina abbiamo fatto un giro di prova con Victor e con Luke e quindi ci sono tante cose da fare al di là della, della mia preparazione personale per la gara, però per quanto mi riguarda sto giocando, sto giocando abbastanza bene e spero di, di riuscire a fare una bella settimana come avevo fatto l'anno scorso. Come hai trovato il percorso di gara a un anno di distanza? L'anno scorso poi qui sei stato protagonista di una only one e di un ottimo quinto posto a fine torneo. Il campo è molto maturato rispetto all'anno scorso, l'anno scorso si vedeva che in alcuni punti era ancora molto nuovo, e sicuramente direi che quando eravamo venuti a maggio a fare un primo giro del campo in vista della Ryder alcune delle indicazioni che, che avevamo dato sono state prese in considerazione, sono stati fatti dei, dei piccoli cambiamenti. Credo che la 18 dal T nuovo sia nettamente una buca più interessante e più bella da giocare. E alcuni ferri sono stati stretti. Secondo me sarà, sarà di nuovo un ottimo test come era già stato l'anno scorso. E poi probabilmente per la Ryder dovremmo fare ancora qualche piccolo cambiamento per cercare di approfittare il più possibile di, del vantaggio di giocare in casa. Ecco, come è cambiata adesso la, la tua esperienza da, da, da giocatore eh, vivendo anche questo doppio ruolo di, di giocatore e vice capitano? Ma sicuramente sono un po' più indaffarato di prima, ci sono più cose da fare. Due settimane fa abbiamo giocato in Danimarca, c'era anche Luke, e praticamente ogni sera siamo andati alla cena insieme. Quindi cerchiamo un po' di separare le due cose, però alla fine ogni giorno passiamo un'ora, due ore a parlare di, di, della rider, dei giocatori, dei criteri di qualifica, di, di tutto quello che, che può essere inerente al tema. Eh, però eh, devo dire che è molto divertente, ci troviamo molto bene, è molto bello lavorare sia con lui che, che con Thomas e, e spero che alla fine riusciremo a fare un buon lavoro. A proposito di Ryder, a proposito dei giocatori, un field eccezionale, eh, da, a partire da, da Rory McIlroy, Fitzpatrick, Hovland, hai avuto modo di, di scambiare delle opinioni anche con loro? Sì, ovviamente abbiamo fatto oggi 18 buche con Victor, eh, Fitz aveva già giocato l'anno scorso, quindi aveva già visto il campo nella sua prima versione, diciamo. Eh, Rory so che ha fatto 9 buche stamattina, eh, andiamo a cena domani sera insieme, quindi sicuramente avremo modo di di scambiarci idee, opinioni e, e sentire anche i suoi eventuali consigli, e, ma credo che insomma, tutta la squadra è molto allineata, sanno quello, che, sanno quello che devono fare, sanno quello che gli aspetterà tra un anno e quindi si sta creando secondo me un'atmosfera ideale per, per raggiungere un buon risultato. Domande dei colleghi? Pregunta in spagnolo, Eduardo sì. Matías Miguel Torge, Handicap 54 Argentina. Siguiendo con il tema della Ryder Cup, abbiamo nel field eh, Rasmus Hogar, Adrian Naus, Adrian Meronk. Mm -hmm. Sono parte di ese futuro che necessita il equipo europeo? Come lo vedi e qual è la tua opinione? Sì, io credo che sicuramente lo stress che tu hai nombrato sono son parte del, del futuro de, dell'equipo d'Europa. Eh, puede ser que ya, que ya van a jugar el año que viene y, y si no seguramente jugarán en no, las la próximas ediciones porque son todos jugadores muy jóvenes, muy buenos hay otros también, hay, hay Bob McIntyre, hay Guido Migliozzi eh, seguramente me, me olvido a alguien pero hay, yo creo que en este momento en Europa hay, hay muchos buenos jugadores que todavía no están a un nivel de, de jugar una rider, pero en 12 meses en el golf puede, puede cambiar muchas cosas. Y, y entonces yo creo que algunos de esos que tú, que tú has nombrado seguramente van a estar aquí en un año y, y los que no estarán puede ser que vengan aquí justo a mirar y después en dos años tiene otra oportunidad. Perfecto. Muchas gracias. 
Ciao Edoardo Alessandro di Notizie Golf. Parlando di statistiche, so che sorriderei un po', visto che lo fai anche di lavoro. La futura squadra di Ryder Cup sarà giovane? Guardando proprio i dati. Io credo che sicuramente sarà più giovane di quella che ha giocato nel 2021, perché per diversi motivi abbiamo perso alcuni giocatori, eh, soprattutto per motivi di anagrafici di età, perché i vari Poulter, Westwood erano, hanno già fatto fatica a qualificarsi per l'ultima, quindi non credo che, che l'anno prossimo credo che sarà molto difficile per loro riuscire a entrare in squadra. E quindi da un, da un lato sono motivi anagrafici, dall'altro, come dicevo prima al tuo collega, ci sono tanti buoni giocatori in Europa che stanno crescendo bene, quindi a partire da, dai due Hoygaard, da Guido, McIntyre, eh, Arnaus, Detri. Ce ne, ce ne sono tanti che sono appena sotto quel livello e nel giro di un anno secondo me diversi di, di quelli saranno pronti per giocare. Esistono contatti tra eh, capitani di Ryder Cup Europe e USA? Vi scambiate qualche idea? Sai se verranno a maggio o c'è silenzio assoluto e guerra? No, silenzio assoluto e anzi cerchiamo anche di nascondere il più possibile tutto quello che, che possiamo. Pardon, Suzanne Kemper, Golf Global Japan. Yep. A uh, couple of questions about have you did you play in your either early days or amateur days the course before it was redone? Yeah. What do you see are the differences between the original course which won the cup yep. and the the remake or the retouches that yep. they've done for the Ryder Cup? Could you highlight those? Yeah, please? I mean it's uh, I played the old golf course quite a few times. We had a few Italian championship here, so I played as an amateur. Um It's obviously way different than, than what it used to be. Like the old golf course was, was still a very nice golf course, but it was uh, too short for today's standards. Um, there were nowhere near enough room for spectators for the Ryder Cup. So obviously they, they changed it completely. I think the only hole which is somewhat similar is the sixth hole. And every other, every other hole is completely different. Uh, I think the golf course is very good. It's, uh, I mean, last year, It was by far the, the best uh, maintained, the best conditioned golf course we play all year. Um, the design probably, I mean, when it's, uh, it's very difficult to get a good golf course straight away at your first attempt, so there's always some tweaking and changing that, that goes on. Uh, something happened already this year, there will be a little bit more going on this winter. Uh, but I think overall it's a, it's a very good design, it's got a, a great finish. I think 14 to 18 is a, is a great finishing stretch for the, for the Ryder Cup. Uh, and I think it would be a lot of fun for the spectators to, to come and watch it. Okay. Uh, and if we look at that, the, the finish, yeah. um, let's hope that the matches go further yeah. rather than, yeah. <laughs> and as you say, 18th is, is really, and yeah. the 16th too, yeah. obviously. I mean, these are exciting holes. Um, compared with other Ryder Cup courses, you've yeah. played in the, in the matches, yeah. you know some of the other ones. Yeah. How would you relate what they've done here to make this a spectacular course for the matches? Well, I think uh, compared to other courses, this was built with the Ryder Cup in mind. So I think for spectators, it would be much better than a few of the previous venues we played. Um, and then as far as, as far as playing, I think it, it was just built with the idea to have like various sets of tees that you can move around and, and you know, make the holes play a little bit different depending on the you know, weather conditions for the day, whether, you know, sometimes four ball foursomes, you might change a few tees up. Um, so I think it's got a lot of flexibility, a lot of options. And um, as I said, you know, the, the finishing stretch from four, 13, 14, even, even 12 is going to be, we're going to make a slight change this winter. And I think 12 to 18 is really, is really good stretch of holes. And, and most of the match, well, all the matches will be decided in, in that stretch. And uh, And I think it's going to be a great test and something that the player will enjoy. When will we know about what these changes are? Uh, we, we discussed yesterday a few things with Luke, but as I said uh, before, we don't want to, to give away too much information. So it's, uh, it's something, it'll be small tweaks. It, it's nothing going to be major changes, but there will be little tweaks and changes happening. Okay, and now coming to your contribution, which everybody is so thrilled about, Heinrich was, Luke has, yeah. can you share so that I can explain a little bit to some of our readers, mm -hmm. what are some of the analysis and the statistics that you do that are so important? Uh, well, In I, I, layman's I, I, terms, not 
for the you know yeah, yeah. the high tech guys no, in no, the world. Yeah. Well, I started, Think me a blonde, you know. Yeah, I started doing this about three four years ago, and um, it became very popular with a lot of players. Uh, what I'm doing with individual players is just uh, trying to help them understanding their strengths and weaknesses, what's happening when they're playing well, what changes when they're not playing so well, so that they kind of manage their game a little bit better. And then lately we've been doing a lot more like course management and, and how to play certain holes based on, again, your strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, when I spoke with, uh, with Luke, uh, when he was named captain, he was very keen on, on having me on board because he thinks, you know, I, he thinks I can help. I, I work with, you know, probably, I, I'm, I'm going to guess by th this time next year, I'll have at least half of the team, if not more, working, working with me. And, and it's just going to be, I think it's going to be helpful from, from a player point of view, from the feedback I get from the players. It's just uh, helping them making better decisions on the course. And, you know, if we could save each one of them, you know, even if it's only one shot a week, to some of these guys, it's, it's a lot. I mean, sometimes the difference between finishing second or winning a tournament or finishing outside the top 10 or inside the top 10. So we're just trying to find small margins and small edges and, and try to, to help each and every one of them to, to play better and perform better. And, and hopefully we'll do the same thing during the Ryder Cup. The Ryder Cup will be a little bit of this and then it will be more about you know, wild card picks, picking the right guys for the team, for the course, uh, you know, pick the right pairings as well. I mean, when you think about it, more than half the points in the Ryder Cup are, are it's, it's a team event, so it's like four ball and foursomes. And if you get the pairings right, I think that can go a long way to, to winning a Ryder Cup, and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. So that was one of my questions, because helping people understand, as we've all seen over the years, the mm -hmm. pairings become, as you say, yeah. very critical. Yeah. So this will also weigh in on helping Luke and the rest of your team as, as vice captains yeah. make the right pairing decisions. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it won't be only based on, on stats because at the end of the day, you want to you know, you make sure that the two guys like each other, they like to play with each other, they're, they're friendly with each other. Not like Mickelson and Tiger. Yeah, I don't <laughs> want to name anyone, but yeah, there, there's been done some mistakes in the past from, well, from both sides. I mean, we did some mistakes in the past as well, but you just weigh in your all your options and then you make the best what you think the best decision is for the team and i think as long as we don't as long as we avoid like the, the big mistakes i think we're we're in a good starting point well congratulations and europe needs you thank we're you. looking forward to you thank winning you. okay thank you thank you Uh, Graham Jenkins here from Eurosport. Um, yeah. Just one quick follow-up on the Ryder Cup. Luke spoke last week and just mentioned you were quite influential in the decision to increase the number of captain's picks. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could shed some light on that process that came to that decision. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a look at uh, the last few Ryder Cups and uh, obviously historically in Europe we've always had between four, three picks most of the time. Sometimes it was even two picks in the past. And... Um, there's a few reasons. I mean, one of the reasons is that on paper we're not, we don't have the, number, the strength in depth that the U.S. team might have. So you want to have as many options available as you want. You want to have informed players in the team, and by by limiting the number of automatic spots and having more picks, it just gives you more flexibility when the time comes. Whether you want to have some players that are playing really well in recent weeks, whether you want to have you might need a partner for one of our top guys to play in foursome or four ball, and then all of a sudden you find one that is a perfect fit and is a good fit for the golf course. You might want to have experienced players. You might have experienced players already in the team, so you might want to have rookies. I think that the bigger number of picks just allows you to, to pick the best possible team. And, you know, in most cases, I think, you know, number seven and eight, I would say they will have a great chance to be picked. But on the other hand, you might have a player who plays very well in the beginning of the qualifying process, and then all of a sudden he's playing very poorly in the last four or five months. And if he finishes outside those top six, then he might not get a pick because if he's playing poorly, he might not. While if you had, say, nine automatic picks or eight automatic picks, and then only four wild cards, then unfortunately you could have a player that 
you don't really want in the team between, you know, if you know what I mean. So it's like, I think it, it just having the, the flexibility and just making sure that our team will be the strongest possible team, the best for this course, and everyone will, will gel together nicely. While, again, having less picks, it just uh, ties your hands a little bit more. And, I mean, the Americans did the exact same thing two years ago. They went to six picks. And then again, I think uh, if you want to have your best team, I think that the, the more picks you have, the better. But also you can't have like 12 picks because it, it, it's not realistic. But I think six and six is a, is a good number to have. And you just make sure that basically the, the six guys that will qualify, you know that they will have played well for 12 months because they will need to get a lot of points. And you can't only get those points in like a three month stretch. So the six guys that would qualify would be like the, the core of the team and they would be like very strong and consistent players and then you just um, complete the team with the, with the guys around them. Bene, se non ci sono altre domande... No, un'altra domanda. Eduardo, come le definirías el legado de la Ryder Cup a aquellos jugadores que recién se están incorporando, que hemos hablado, Hogar, Arnaus y demás. Eh, yo creo que la Ryder es el de lejos, es el mejor evento de golf que existe al mundo. Eh, hay, hay muchos jugadores que, que han, han dedicado la, la carrera y, y han definido su propia carrera con jugando Ryder. Y yo creo que es muy difícil de, de si, si uno nunca ha sido en una Ryder Cup, es muy difícil de explicarle cómo, cómo es, lo que se siente como jugador jugando y todo. Pero yo creo que como, como jugador es, como te diría, de, de lejos, es el mejor evento que, que se puede jugar, mejor que ningún Major, mejor que ninguna otra, otra competición, porque al final... Es, un, es una competición, sí, por equipo, es verdad que esto vale mucho, pero sobre todo el, el ambiente que se crea con el público, con la afición, es, es muy particular y es algo que es único en nuestro deporte. Muchas gracias. Otra pregunta de Susan Kemper. Sí, yeah. yes, una última pregunta, o por lo menos para mí. Talking about the picks, has there been any discussion what might happen over the year as far as the ranking points as with the live players? Because obviously Europe has some really high level guys there. Uh, there Can you has share been with us that yeah, yeah, well there hasn't been much discussion to be honest. Uh, as of today, as as Keith said last week, it's uh, you know, they can qualify, they can get picks, they can you know, we, we we're treating them exactly the same as everyone else uh, so if you know if they play well enough and I think at the minute they, they can make the team and then we just need to see what's going to happen in the in the court case in February but that's out of our hands and uh, so it's not much I can say to be honest because it's uh, we didn't have much discussion it's all pretty straightforward at the minute and we just need to wait and see what's going to happen in the court case in February. No, 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 because there's been so much rumors. That's why I was yeah, wanting no. to ask you. So, yeah, at the, minute, at the minute, if they play well enough, they can definitely qualify. <laughs>